Good afternoon. First coach of the afternoon is Mike Leach, the head football coach at Mississippi State. He's a two-time national coach of the year, a three-time Power Five conference coach of the year. So that, just to be clear, a, a coach of the year in a conference setting on three different occasions in two different conferences. Mastermind behind the NCAA record setting air raid offense. He instructed me that the line that says he walks on water is now incorrect. He actually jogs on water. Um, he's compiled 150 wins, guided his teams to 18 bowl games, produced seven, season of his, uh, seven seasons of at least nine victories, won two conference division titles, the winningest coach at Texas Tech and record for bowl appearances at both Texas Tech and Washington State. He has three degrees, one from BYU, an undergraduate degree, a Juris Doctorate degree from Pepperdine, great location to go to law school, and a master, master's degree from the United States Sports Academy. He coached, was a head coach of a football team in Finland in the European Football League. When he was at Washington State, he taught a five-week course on insurgent warfare and football strategies this past spring at Mississippi State. He had several hundred Mississippi State students gather for a special guest lecture on the same topic. He's an author of two books, provides, I've been told, outstanding Netflix recommendations, although he's never shared those with me. He's an expert on best barbecue in town. Uh, and also as a world traveler. So this year, Columbia and Panama, last year an African safari. The head football coach at Mississippi State University, Mike Leach. All right, well, I appreciate that. Any questions? All right, if you have questions, raise your hand. We'll get started right away. Aaliyah, Bailey, and Kiera will get to you. Uh, we're going to go right over here on our left, third row. Coach, right over here to our left. Should be good. Go ahead and try it again. Yep. All right, we need you to get can that yell, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> Let's try to get, uh, do we have another microphone? Can we go ahead and get the sound in the back up, please? All right, we need the, the question mics up, please. Let's try it again over here on the left. How you doing, Coach Lee Scotty from Offscript? Um, I asked Coach Lane about the personalities in Mississippi. He corrected me and said there were three, including yourself. Um, what possibilities you, Lane Kiffin, have in playing Jackson State, being in-state uh, competition for each other? <clears throat> is there a possibility that you'll ever see or your team will play at HBCU as Jackson State? You know, I'm not sure. I, I mean, it's possible. I think it's possible. I don't, we don't have anything scheduled that I'm aware of. Uh, <clears throat> of course, on my staff, uh, Tony Hughes used to coach at Jackson State, and, and I know a bunch of those guys on the staff, and, that, you know, they do a really good job. And then uh, <clears throat> Coach Sanders is a blast, if you know him. I mean, uh, you know, just talking to him is fun. And then, uh, uh, I, I mean, I wouldn't rule it out, but we don't have anything scheduled. Okay, we're going to go right here on this near aisle. Uh, Drew. Drew DeArmond, WZZN Radio, Huntsville, Alabama coach. I wanted to ask you about your offense. Uh, it's, of course, the air raid. You've been known for production since your days at Texas Tech. Uh, you took a jump in productivity in year two. What's the area you think that needs to be improved the most, and what do you like about your offense heading into year three? Well, we've got some starts. We're still, I guess, on paper kind of a medium young team, but um, we, we do have a lot of starts, and I think that's helpful. So we do have experience to draw on. I think we need to sharpen up at receivers. I think we need to kind of uh, <clears throat> polish up our receiver play. I mean, we have good guys that work hard and, uh, um, <clears throat> you know, I have a sense of urgency, that type of thing. But we, uh, you know, I just think we need to be sharper. We have a mixture of really young and, 
and old there, and so, and I do think we're getting better, and I thought we had a good spring, um, but I think we can sharpen up there. Coach, we'll go over to our right, about halfway back. Connor O'Gara, Saturday Down South. Uh, Sankey said that you have some Netflix recommendations. Would you be willing to share those with us? Yeah, he, uh, you know, I, I, I wish I'd watched more Netflix lately. Um, and I haven't. Somebody said I need to watch the terminal list, which I haven't watched it yet. Um, you know, the I guess the hidden gem, uh, which I think I said it last year, Operation Odessa, that uh, documentary, you need to watch that, um, <coughs> about uh, these uh, international criminals that uh, try to buy a submarine for Pablo Escobar. That's worth watching. Um, I wish I could tell you I'd, I'd watch more Netflix. I haven't watched a lot lately. And uh, during the season, it's good to watch, uh, you know, to kind of get your head straight. But I did, <clears throat> I'm up to date on Better Call Saul. I'm up to date on Yellowstone. Uh, oh, I, yeah, I'll tell you, that's part of it. The, the kids got me into Stranger Things. And <clears throat> I'm certainly not ready for this season. I'm about halfway through. Um, and uh, I don't know. <clears throat> so if you guys have any good recommendations, I could probably use them. Um, and so I, I guess I'll defer to the numbers here. All right, Coach, we'll go right in front of me, about three rows back. Kirk? Uh, Kirk Bowles from the Austin American Statesman. Oh, good to see you again. Good to see you, Mike. Severance is pretty good. I'm not sure if that's Netflix or not. What about is it? Severance, about mind control. Oh, yeah. So I might check it out. Well, don't try any funny stuff. Okay, all right. <laughs> I couldn't get to you. Uh, I know you miss Texas and Oklahoma desperately. Uh, I was curious to your reaction when you found they were going to be doing the conference, and how long do you think it would take them to get acclimated for this league? Well, I, I think they're kind of already acclimated from the standpoint, you know, um, good teams play as hard as they can and try to improve their skills along the way. And <clears throat> so I, I think they're certainly ready to do that. I think uh, the competition level raised. Uh, um, and then, uh, you know, from my standpoint, and I get asked that, especially from the Texas and the Oklahoma people, um, from their standpoint, I think it's going to change things quite dramatically. Um, from our standpoint, um, I mean, uh, you guys have us as uh, um, <clears throat> having the toughest schedule in the country. So that being the case, uh, you know, we, we can't play everybody. Uh, so knock two of those guys off and add OU in Texas, and I probably gained about half a step, I would think. Um, you know, I mean, the... Uh, yeah, the, the, the two most eastern teams uh, in the west are the two Alabama schools. So send them east, and we have to play Texas and OU, and, and I probably gained a little on that. Hey, Coach, we'll go over to our right side along the far aisle. Brent Swarneman, Houston Chronicle. Coach, whose side are you on in Jimbo versus Nick? Oh, I think they both kind of illustrate the frustration of uh, – how things are, you know, right now, and I, it's not sustainable, so something's going to change. You know, right now, um, well, we haven't defined what exactly is a, an amateur or a student athlete as opposed to a professional, and I think we need to do that. And I think there is ways to do it. I think that, you know, um, <clears throat> uh, some football players may be in their best interest to remain a student athlete. and. Uh, you know, under that model as opposed to professional and vice versa. And I think that's got to be defined. Currently, um, you know, college athletes have uh, more privileges than, than anybody at any other professional level. And whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, I don't think it stays the same uh, because there's responsibilities that go along with being a professional. And I've said this before. You've probably already written it down. Uh, but, you know, those guys lock themselves in rooms and watch film all the time, so you'll be able to get away with it. 
um, <clears throat> go up to your, your next favorite NFL guy and uh, say, hey, uh, I heard in the NFL they're going to have uh, unmitigated free agency 365, 24-7. And by the way, there's not going to be any salary cap uh, or draft. You're just going to have bidding wars. And, and just watch the expression on their face. And don't look at anything else or write down any notes because the, the expression on their face will be well worth it. And uh, so I don't see this as, uh, you know, I, I don't think the dust is settled. Like that, this, we're in a big transition period on a number of things in college football and, uh, uh, you know, and, and we got, you know, sharp guys actively trying to sort it out and, uh, and you know, and I hope that it will be. And, um, but, uh, yeah. Coach, we're going to go uh, right here in the section in front of me about halfway back. There we go. Good afternoon, Coach. Jacob Goins from ESPN 106.7 in Auburn. Now that you have some experience as a head coach here in the SEC West, how have you adjusted your coaching strategies with such a tough schedule year in and year out? Well, you just try to get better. I mean, I, I, you know, there's, there's not much to adjust. So, I mean, if you're determined to improve your team, you know, the best way to improve the team is improve yourself. And after that, everybody gets on that page. And then um, if you're constantly trying to improve yourself, you're trying to get better and you're trying to do the best you can. So, you you, you know, you can, uh, uh, if you have full effort, then eventually, uh, you know, you can improve from that and uh, set a new ceiling. And if you're doing that all the time, if you're truly doing that all the time, then there's, there's not much to save. I mean, I, you know, it's funny because uh, folks act like there's some kind of a reserve. You know, well, there's a reserve they haven't used. Well, they're playing this type of team, so, you know, we're going to perfectly gauge how much effort we, you know, saving. Like, because if you save effort, you don't get to spend it on the next guy, you know. I mean, no, you do the best you can. You try to improve. And most importantly, it's important to do the best you can under all circumstances so that, uh, so that you are improving, and that's what you do. You just uh, play the very best you can. And then, and then uh, so there's not much to change, you know, with regard to, you know, uh, the SEC is the most talented conference. Uh, I don't think there's any question about that. But, you know, I mean, as, as far as uh, coaching your team and winning games, uh, and being the best you can with what you have. It's eerily similar to Iowa Wesleyan. Coach, we're going to go over here on the left side near the back along the far aisle. Uh, yes, sir. Edgar Thompson of the Orlando Sentinel. Nick Saban's uh, so-called blueprint has kind of provided the template for a lot of coaches around the league with varying degrees of success. Being in the game as long as you have and, and kind of marching to your own beat. What, what do you notice about what some of the underpinnings of it and, and why it's so successful for him? I guess I don't fully understand the question. Um, uh, well, I mean, it's not, some of it's the resources of the program, not to take any way, thing away from uh, Coach Saban because he does a tremendous job and he's – uh, and then also has a, a big tree of coaches, um, you know, but uh, there's, you know, circumstances can be beneficial too. I mean, uh, you know, he's done things at Alabama that nobody thought were possible, uh, but I would say that, uh, um, you know, he's a better coach at Alabama than he was at Michigan State, for example. And uh, so I think there's some circumstances that can contribute to, you know, success too that have to be accounted for. But he does a tremendous job of, uh, you know, getting the most out of his players. And one thing that I've always liked is, you know, he's not afraid to coach them hard. And then doing that over and over again. I mean, he's a guy that we all, uh, you know, admire. And, you know, and, uh, and then, of course, uh, the magnitude and power of uh, Alabama commands attention. All right, Coach, we'll go right here in front of me, two rows. Tom? Hey, Coach, Tom Murphy, Arkansas Democrat Gazette. I think it's a new ad, but Countdown to Pearl Harbor was compelling to me on Netflix. Oh, yeah, you hear that? Countdown to Pearl Harbor. Don't miss that one. <laughs> um, 
why no opening statement for you? And then two questions. Um, where do you think you're going to be better as a team this coming year? And then what Will Rogers needs, needs to improve on this year, too? Uh, okay, so um, opening statements. Well, I hate opening statements, and um, and I really don't see the point of it. And uh, so, as opposed to me sit there and think of some flowery opening statement, which I've done before, and then uh, at the end of the opening statement, uh, a number of people ask questions that have already been addressed in my opening statement. I decided we just sort of cut out the middleman, and then. Uh, you go ahead and ask the questions, and I'll go ahead and answer them. And then, um, and then, uh, uh, some. Uh, I think Will Rogers is going to improve. I think he needs to incrementally improve. And then I think that, uh, um, <clears throat> you know, offensively, everybody working together. We, I think, we took a step in spring, and we have to keep uh, uh, doing it during camp. All right, Coach. We'll go over here to our left. Let me out. Hey, Mike, Stefan Kreisnick with the Clarion Ledger. Uh, you, you take a, or you've talked in the past about your air raid, you know, being a, a strategy you have that when you go face a team, it's the only time they face an offense like yours. Uh, how do you, I guess, adjust to that when, when you're facing teams now in the SEC like in Alabama or in Ole Miss that have seen your offense three, or two or three times now as you go into this season? Well, so many people have, uh, are adopting air raid concepts. You know, maybe it's not exactly what we do, but you know, like uh, basically spread controlled passing games. That's all around uh, the league now. And, uh, and you know, with rare exception, the whole NFL. Uh, so, you know, you see it a lot. And it's, you know, it's not uh, all of a sudden um, they haven't seen it because they saw it uh, in a number of teams that they played or at least some variation. Uh, but football has always been a game of execution. And, um, um, you know, there's not a lot of uh, road runner Wiley Coyote who you ambushed and fooled the other guy, and you know, and then you walk away laughing like Mutley after, you know, uh, the rock fell on the guy or something like that. I mean, so it's you know, it's always been a game of execution. It doesn't matter what you do schematically, uh, you have to execute well. And I do think some schemes are better than others, but. Um, the most important thing is execution, and we spend more time thinking about pr practice and how to, you know, teach what we want to execute. And the more sharply refined you can teach it and focus on it, the better you're going to be. Right, Coach, we'll go over here to our right on the far aisle, about midway back. Hey, Coach, Ken Caps from uh, Football Writers of America. What do you have to say to the Texas and Oklahoma fans about coming to the SEC? Well, I look forward to seeing them. I mean, I, I thought they were outstanding when I was in Texas. And of course, we played them both every year. Uh, look forward to seeing them. I mean, from my standpoint, it's good to have them, have them back, you know. And then, uh, uh, you know, but uh, and then, yeah, of course, you guys can debate, uh, you know, where everybody's best off. But um, uh, no, I look forward to seeing them. I know a lot of Longhorns, and I know a lot of Sooners. And, and coached at Oklahoma. So, you know, uh, I've been a Sooner sympathizer for a while and, uh, and uh, you know, look forward to having them back. And if you have a question, raise your hand. We're going to go on the aisle right in front of us, midway back. Michael? Hey, Michael Cusker on AL.com. Just wondering, how have you seen the evolution of calling trick plays? How has that evolved over the years? Has it become more difficult with the offenses getting more exotic and it's harder to trick people? Uh, I'll tell you that, you know, you bring up something that I've kind of thought about a little bit, and I wish I had a good resolution to it. Uh, no, there's still trick plays. There's, they, they still do trick plays, and trick plays need to be executed well. So, and trick plays have a value of the opponent seeing them just from the standpoint now they have to adjust and they have to you know, deal with something. And then the other thing, um, you know, and, and, and then they, their imagination, of course, could go wild on what else may be coming, you know. And so it does uh, create a certain amount of psychological damage, whether it works or not. Um, you know, uh, and it depends. I mean, well, there's all kinds of trick plays. We can think of all kinds of them. 
the rules have kind of a, a some, uh, somewhat aggressively tried to prevent trick plays, which I, I don't care for that approach. You know, um, I mean, there's been one rule after the next, you know, that uh, over the years that uh, uh, you can't have trick plays or you can't have a certain type of play, which essentially was a trick play, which was probably a good idea. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, people squawked enough that, uh, you know, they legislated against it. I actually wish we still had uh, drop kicks, but um, I had the perfect guy to do it too at Washington State, uh, Logan Tago. He could drop kick it about 50 yards out. Anyway, so, um, um, but uh, yeah, there's a, there's a, uh, I don't like to homogenize and, you know, uh, you know, make uh, football kind of a cubicle game. And I think that some of these rules eliminating trick plays uh, do just that. I think that, it, that of course is ridiculous. But I also think this, you gotta pick your type of trick play and so, <clears throat> There's more three-man fronts and, uh, you know, nickel and dime packages as a result of people throwing it a lot more. So this notion of getting behind them is more difficult um, <clears throat> because teams are playing looser. But that doesn't mean there's other trick plays that you can't do underneath that are pretty good, and you'll see some every year. I do think there's a little less, though. Like, for example, I think... Um, <clears throat> Take the RPO crowd, for example. I think, um, uh, you know, the RPO guy has uh, two or three reads of play. And it's not really a trick play. He's just going to try to put the ball where the defense isn't. <clears throat> but, uh, you know, I think uh, with those reads and things, that replaces some trick plays. I think Coach will go down here in front of me. Bob? Uh, hey, Mike. Uh, Bob Holt, Arkansas Democrat Gazette. I wanted to ask, uh, follow up on Will. Um, you've obviously coached a lot of great quarterbacks. Well, what do you really like about his game? What makes him so good? And what do you think his ceiling is? And as another one, uh, I know you got a couple transfer kickers. Um, how are those guys? What, what are you expecting from, from those guys? Do you feel like you'll have a good kicker? Um, well, I, th I think, well, first of all, Will stepped in and had great leadership qualities and wasn't afraid to talk to the locker room as a freshman, uh, which uh, I think is uh, one of the more impressive, courageous things that he did. It allowed him to excel early. It allowed him to f uh, focus in on uh, <clears throat> playing because he didn't have some of that stage fright that initial freshmen do. Uh, so I, I think it allowed him to progress quicker. I also, I think it allowed the team to draw <clears throat> uh, from him and kind of unify things. I think that was very impressive. I think Will's going to get better and better. And then uh, the better he synchronizes with the other offensive players, uh, the better everybody is. And then sometimes I think it's difficult to define what's Will, what's the receivers, what's the running backs, what's the O-line. Uh, but, you know, that's the thing is football is a team game, so everybody together is the most important part of it. Um, yes, something else. What was the other Transfer part? kickers, Coach. Oh, <clears throat> yeah, I had good luck with kickers through my whole career, uh, including the time a guy walked out of the stands that we went ahead and had kick for us the next week. And uh, we definitely hit a drought last year, and that was uh, – well, that was unfortunate, and uh, um, <clears throat> but we have uh, several guys there kicking, and uh, the ones that were here in spring uh, looked uh, very promising and did a, a good job. And then um, we have uh, uh, some others on campus that uh, you know really have pretty good profiles. So yeah, I'm optimistic. Uh, we'll have a kicker. Coach, we're going to go back here to the right side. Uh, standing up. There we go. Robert Cessna, the Bryan College Station Eagle. Mike, what's your thoughts on USC and UCLA going to the Big Ten, and what do you think is going to happen to your old uh, Pac-12 conference? You know, I don't know exactly. And, um, and a guy asked me something like that before. The biggest would, the surprise uh, in college football would be if there's no surprises, but I would say that's a pretty big one. Um, 
and, and this is just uh, <clears throat> uh, one guy talking. I mean, I, uh, I don't know. These are questions I have. Uh, the question I have is one, uh, if the Pac-12 does manage to stick together, um, <clears throat> how much does it or does it help uh, Cal and Utah uh, get more recruits in Southern California? Um, and then the other is, is, and I've been on long trips like that, um, <clears throat> uh, UCLA and uh, USC have to take five a year. Uh, across uh, two or three time zones, and um, I don't think they're going to play <clears throat> all those games at uh, noon, say. I bet, yeah, I bet you they play a bunch of them at night. And, um, <clears throat> and then they have to do it five times a year, and then the rest of the Big Ten has to do it uh, uh, less than one time every other year. So I'm kind of curious how it will unfold, and uh, you know, and I'll uh, be here to watch it and uh, maybe such a great idea, everybody will do it. Coach, we'll go right in front of you, second row. Thanks. Coach Colin Wilson with the Action Network. As a master of the air raid and doing it for so long, is there a correlation to time off bye weeks or before bowl games getting the air raid out of sync, uh, or does it just an anomaly or does it ever start slow? How does the air raid get affected by bye weeks and time off? Well, I've seen it go both ways, and I've seen bye weeks pretty much go uh, both ways with everybody. You know, I think that, um, you know, I mean, I've had bye weeks where, you know, we're just ridiculously explosive, and I've had other ones where it was tough to get out of the shoot. Um, yeah, I, I think that, uh, you know, you just have to maintain the focus, just maintain the focus, and everybody's got... Uh, control over that to a point, but I think it needs to be a team unified deal. And uh, uh, I've seen it go both ways. I do think it uh, uh, can make things a little more extreme. Right, Coach, we'll go back over here to our left on the aisle. Uh, Mike, you were talking there about the Pac-12 a little bit, I guess. Are you excited to get back? Uh, I think it's week two you guys are playing at Arizona. And I guess how do you prepare for playing, a, I think it's a 10 p.m kickoff in Starkville while you guys are in Arizona? Uh, you don't prepare for it at all. You, uh, you know, you go there, uh, you go there, win the game, and uh, get on the plane, sleep the best you can, uh, have uh, later meetings on Sunday, and then, uh, you know, put it in and do it again. Okay, we'll go here to the right side, coming up from behind you on the other end. Here we go. Mike, John Clay with Aero Leader in Lexington. Talking about the Air Raid, how much has your particular version of the Air Raid changed, if at all, since you and Hal were together in Lexington? It has. That's hard for me to gauge because, I mean, some of these changes are gradual over the years. And, um, you know, uh, some I forgot we changed. Some um, I forgot when we changed it. Uh, some I could tell you kind of clearly. Um, but, uh, you know, like, uh, you know, if we adopt a new play, I've always tried to cut one that we have so that, uh, so we can control the package and practice and execute it because execution is most, uh, most important. You're better off having too small of a package than too big a one. Um, often it's like, uh, you know, techniques or a tag or an adjustment that may be changed or perhaps where the way you practice it. It's, it's something you try to grow and build on, you know, all the time. Uh, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, watching film, every everything from high school through to the NFL and just try to figure, we used to call it, uh, you know, the whole find a better way to build the mousetrap, you know. We'll take one final question right in front. Second row, Brett. Hey, Mike. I'm Brett McMurphy with the Action Network. With all of the conferences growing, 16 teams, maybe even bigger, are you optimistic for your 64-team playoff to ever get here? Huh. <laughs> that may be a conference championship you're referring to. 
I, I, I don't know. It's at some point. Uh, at some point, uh, you know. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm beginning to lose track of uh, what's a league and what's a conference or and what's a division. You know, and uh, but uh, you know, I, you know, the more the merrier, I guess. And uh, I'm not. I'm not against any of it. And then, <clears throat> as far as playoffs, there's a you know, a lot of models and my thoughts on the playoffs are well documented, but, uh, you know, we have a great committee thinking about it, considering it. And, um, <clears throat> and I do think, uh, it's steadily improved. So. All right. Coach Leach, thank you for your time this afternoon. All right. Thank you very much.